Hey, welcome back to the Farewell North devlog. If this is your first time watching, Farewell North is a game about restoring color to the world. So you explore this dark and foreboding archipelago or its chain of islands, and you find these runes to unlock and restore color. And as you do, life and, and new elements come back to the islands. In this video, I want to go over a challenge I've had, which is to make the colored world a little more interesting. So what I've found so far in playing and testing the game is that you spend about 90-95% of the time in the uncolored world. And so for a game that's about restoring color, I want there to be a reason why you're restoring color and I want to give you some um, motivation to stay in the colored areas. So I've been playing with a few ideas and what I came up with... Well first of all, if you, if you see here, so this is a restored area, but there's not a whole lot to do. So you can run around in the grass and everything and I think it looks pretty beautiful. But there's no real reason to stick around and not just run off to the next island and restore color there and kind of rush through the game. I want there to be a little bit more of an incentive to, to have a casual approach and kind of take your time and enjoy the world that you're, you're restoring. So I don't think I've mentioned on the channel, but my wife and I moved to Scotland a year ago. And a lot of this game is inspired by the Scottish Highlands, the Isles of St Kilda specifically, which is this kind of remote archipelago in Ireland. Definitely recommend looking it up if you've never heard of it. It's beautiful, it's very remote, um, it's just got these incredible islands. And so I wanted to kind of dig into Scottish folklore and see if I could find something to kind of find inspiration from. So one of the things I found was the Will of the Wisp. And if you've ever seen the movie, the Pixar movie Brave, these will be familiar to you. They've also shown up in other media and different video games and stuff. They're not specifically Scottish, but they do show up in Scottish folklore. And basically they're these spirits or fairies that kind of play with light and kind of illusions and stuff like that to guide or trick, depending on the folklore, travelers. Um, and so they're, they're pretty beautiful looking and they have uh, kind of a rich history and I think they would fit well with the game. So day one, me and my little colleagues here are set to work. So the first thing I always do is start with a task list. I like to think about this a couple weeks in advance and start thinking through all the different things I'll need for the core mechanic. So you can see that here, basically modeling, animating, some particle systems, and some sort of pathing. So the first thing to do was to get this into Blender. The model is quite simple, and in fact it's actually pretty ugly to look at, if I'm being completely honest. But that's okay, because the idea I had was that you wouldn't actually see the body, it would just be sort of a mesh to emit particles from. So uh, you can see it's really simple, it's just kind of two modified spheres. Um, some eyeballs and like a little kind of arm type type deals and um, not a whole lot to it but as you'll see basically the idea was to use particle systems and instead of rendering the body use the particle system to kind of create this ethereal and very bright and um, you know play with light and everything so quite a bit of work to get all the the particle systems working I always struggle with unity's particle system as you can see, some of these results were not ideal, um, but I spent a good chunk of time um, going through this and you'll see a whole bunch of different iterations here, but basically getting to something that looked semi-decent, uh, which you can see here. So it's still terrible, looks like a disco ball, but we're starting to get somewhere, right? And um, so a couple things, the eyes were wrong, it's way too big. Um, but we're starting to get somewhere, something that looks like a, a wisp, I would say. Um, too much pulsing, the eyes are definitely wrong, but we're getting there. So, back into Blender, a uh, big adjustment to the eyes, <laughs> just elongating them a little bit. Um, and also spent a little bit of time tweaking the arms to make them a little bit more um, visually... I don't know, I, I want them to look very floaty, right? Um, I also added like a kind of point and, and hair, uh, almost effect to the head, but I want them to look very floaty and like they're just effortlessly kind of um, kind of bouncing in the air, if that makes sense. And so I wanted the model to reflect that, to, to look them, to make them look very airy. And you'll see in the animation how that kind of turns out. So we're starting to get to something that looks um, a little bit decent. It's still day one. At this point I was getting a little bit frustrated with the particle system. It just wasn't doing, it wasn't matching kind of the vision I had. So I played with it a little bit more but I wanted to finish day one with a little bit more success, so I decided to work on the collision detection, so I had to write a little bit of code for that. Basically the idea is that you will kind of collect them, almost uh, basically like a collectible, and so there'll be achievements and stuff like that that are completely optional that are related to this. 
And so this was just a little bit of code, pretty straightforward. And I just wanted to kind of finish up day one with a success. So we can see that working easy enough, but not that interesting. So we'll fix that on day two. So this was meant to be a two-day project, and as you can see from the task list, uh, day one wasn't the most productive in terms of getting through all the tasks. So I like, I'd like to start my days with like basically the easiest task if I'm not, if not feeling super motivated. I find once you get one task done, it kind of becomes, uh, you kind of build momentum, it becomes contagious, and you want to just keep going and going. So the easiest one on the list was to basically unlock this by color. So what that means is when the wisp is in range of color, I want the particle system and the renderers and all that kind of stuff to be active and the object to be interactable. And when it's not within range of color, so it's in the uncolored world, um, it shouldn't be there or it should at least have a different effect. So it's maybe a little more faint and you can't interact with them. And so I have this whole system set up based on a scriptable object architecture. So I can just drag these kind of um, these unlockables onto any game object. So I can say if it's in color, turn on the render. If it's out of color, turn on a sound effect or, you know, whatever it is. And so in this case, it was basically just turning on the renderer for the, the body, the eyes, and the particle system if it's within range of color, and turning on the collider so that it can be interacted with. Otherwise, in the uncolored world, um, for now, it's just going to be invisible, but a little later in the video, we'll add a kind of ghostly effect. So it's slightly visible, and there's some sound in the uncolored world to kind of give you a hint that they're there. And so it was all of maybe 20 minutes to get this to work. But I can show you here how this how this is going to work. So you can see right now the color is turned on, so the the wisp is visible. And if I deactivate the rune, you're going to see that it disappears, so it kind of fades away. And as the color comes back, I have this kind of testing tool here. Um, as the color comes back, the particles and the render turn back on. And as color disappears, it basically dissipates and fades away. So it's only going to be interactable in the kind of colored world, and if you were to, if you happen to, to contact it in the uncolored world, nothing would happen. So I mentioned that the way that this was currently set up was pretty uninteresting, where you just kind of jump and contact it. I spent the majority of the time on this feature working on a pathing system, uh, along with my little colleagues, of course, who are always hard at work. And so this was where the majority of the actual coding and, and new development took place. The rest of it basically built on systems that already existed. So I built a wrapper around the Dotween library, which is a great animation library if you haven't used it before. It basically it manages all kinds of different tweening. And I built a path system so you can define waypoints for the, um, for the WISPs. And so when you contact them, it'll basically run a path and it'll move to its next waypoint. And if you contact it again, it'll run the next path and it'll keep doing that until basically it runs out of paths and then finally you collect it. So this is what that looks like. So you can see here uh, these little green circles and then orange circles on the right. So each of these defines a path. So the, the WISP has a starting position, and when you contact it, it's going to run the first path. You can see these waypoints down there in the bottom right. It'll run all the waypoints on the path until it gets to the end, and it'll wait there, and then you contact it again, it moves to the next path. It'll run all those waypoints, wait at the end, and so on and so forth, until it basically it runs out of paths. And then at that point, it actually becomes collectible. So you can quickly kind of drag these around. The Dotween library that, that I built the wrapper around of it basically handles running this using, um, it's called Catmull ROM, and don't ask me exactly what that means, because I don't know offhand, but basically it'll, be, it'll build like a smooth path. So here it looks like there's very sharp edges and everything, but it'll basically smooth it all out, and it'll run the path through the waypoints, and it'll look very kind of floaty, which is exactly what I wanted for this. So it's really easy for me to define the paths. It, you can see here if I wanted it to kind of start flying up into the tree and then loop around, this is what that would look like. and yeah, so it's pretty it's pretty extensible and it makes it very easy for me to design like interesting paths and make sure that it's all looking good. And I think that's a little bit more interesting and it fits more with the Wisp um, folklore because they're kind of guiding you and, and leading you through this this series of trails until you finally get to the end and you kind of collect your reward for doing so. So now that there's something for them to do, it was time to go back into Blender and do some rigging. So I made a simple armature with just I think six or seven bones. And the idea with these animations, like I said, was to make them very floaty. So I want them to feel like they're just very effortlessly kind of gliding around. They're quite quick, they're quite airy, and they're kind of just like bouncing in the air. So what I came up with was three main animations. So there's the idle kind of floating animation, which you can see here. And then there's the flying away. So they kind of do like a half back dive type deal. 
right? And then this can also be reversed for like their kind of stop flying animation. And then finally, there's also the flying animation. So I'm probably gonna change this one. The more I look at it, the more I don't like it, but they do almost like a, a corkscrew type, just kind of twirl in the air. And I thought this would look really interesting with a particle trail. So the particles were kind of like corkscrewing behind them. But um, in practice, I'm not super thrilled with this one. So um, I'll probably come back to it. But anyways, so those are the three animations. Four, if you include the one that can be reversed to be the landing animation, as you see here. Um, so with those in place, just exported it back into Unity and set up a quick little animator controller. Um, nothing too fancy here. It's just a couple states and implemented that into the code. And then we can take a look at how that turned out. So you can see the, now he's kind of floating there and when you make contact with him, he's gonna fly away. But we need sound effects to really sell the effect. Right now it's a little, little dull. So what I do is typically I go to freesound.org and find some sound effects that kind of match what I want. I'm not great at creating them from scratch, but then I'll take into Audacity and really edit it to make sure that it fits perfectly. So I wanted to do the sound effects for just being near them. It's gonna be a whispery kind of noise. And then we need some contact sound effects. And if you see there, I also added the uncolored particle effect. So when you're in the uncolored world, it's kind of ghostly looking. And so here we're making, I'm making four or five different sound effects um, for when you make contact with them. So he's kind of gonna, for better, lack of a better word, wisp away. So I think that sounds pretty good. So the whispers um, kind of wisp away with it. And yeah, now it's starting to come up, come together. So I spent a good while tweaking and, and continuing to refine this, but I think it came to a pretty good point. So let's take a look at the same scene from the beginning of the game. So you can see here, just faintly kind of um, hidden in the environment is the wisps, but you can hear them whispering as you get close to them. And so I think that's gonna be pretty interesting because you'll, you'll kind of uh, maybe find a couple of them in the uncolored world and then know where to go get them when the color's restored. And you can see another one kind of floating up there. And so as the color comes back, they're gonna appear and so now you have a bit of a reason to go looking around and see what was actually brought back in the uncolored world. And there'll be more stuff like this, but this is, this is kind of the first, first of those uh, elements. So now that the, the color's restored, we're gonna be able to go collect that wisp that we found. And I'm able to use this in kind of two ways. So this one here is just purely a collectible, right? There's no, he's not guiding you to anything really. He's just kind of um, flying around and, and giving you kind of a little extra something to, to achieve in the game. And some of them might require platforming or different puzzles or whatever to collect to make it a little more challenging. But that's the idea, is just to give you a little bit more reason to explore the uncolored world. But the other thing is that earlier in the game, I can almost use them as a sort of a guide. So this bridge was restored or revealed when the color was restored, right? It was hidden before. And so now this guy's going to kind of guide you across the bridge and over to the next area. Keep in mind, this is the first and second island in the game. So you've literally been playing the game for three to five minutes at this point. So having a little bit of a guide doesn't hurt. Um, and so now you're you're into the next area and you can start exploring. So that's it guys, that's the Will of the Wisps. Leave a comment down below, let me know what you think about them. I'd love to get your feedback. Keep in mind it's only two days of work, so I'm certain I'm gonna come back to these. I definitely wanna hook them up to Steam achievements to really give an extra reason to go find them all. But I think for purposes of giving you incentive to explore the colored world, I think it's gonna work pretty well. But yeah, let, let me know what you think. I'd love to get your feedback. In the meantime, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. That would really help a lot. That helps YouTube um, share the channel, get more eyes on it. And yeah, it just really helps me out. And the number one thing, if you really wanna, if you really like the look of the game and you're interested in it, go wishlist the game on Steam. I'll leave a link down below. It's completely free, it doesn't cost you anything. It just lets Steam know that there's an audience for the game and it would help me out a ton when the game finally does come out. So. That would mean the world to me. If you do wish us a game, let me know down below. And in any case, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one, and bye for now.